You are listening to WCJV Digital Broadcasting, Youngstown, New York. In between, conspiracies and those who dare to speak the truth, get ready for a walk on the wild side. Welcome to Parlay with your host, Michael Gray. Good evening, or hi, all. Hey, this is Mike Gray with uh, Parlay, and we have another really terrific show for you. We have back with us William Zabel. Uh, William, are you there? Yes, I am. Hey, man, how you doing? Good. Hey, hey, William, you know, you were just telling me this fascinating story, and I, I want to go over all that again. Uh, but okay. um, one thing I just want to go over real quick was this, this shooting uh, in uh, – was it South Carolina? Yeah, South Carolina, yeah. Charleston, South Carolina, the yep. AME uh, church where black um, uh, nine, I should say nine uh, people died. And they, I guess they were black. And the suspect, his name is Dylan Storm Roof. OK. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I have this pegged as a staged fake event. Uh like Sandy Hook, Boston bombing, Aurora, and all the rest. Um, and I've been, you know, looking at like the name Dylan. Uh, the name Dylan is like Gaelic or Welsh means tidal flow. And mm-hmm. then you can go with the name uh, Storm. You know, his name is Dylan Storm Roof. So it's interesting that you have uh, tidal, like you could say, tidal flow Storm Roof, which would be like a tidal wave hitting. Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, why I think this is fake or staged, um, uh, we j- I just got uh, from Cindy Jean-Pierre, actually sent me this, uh, the timestamp, if you look at the timestamp, if you just punch in nine dead in Charleston after church massacre, it's dated June 14th, 2015. The <laughs> next one is dated, now it happened last night, which would be the 17th. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The, the 17th, 6:17. It was 9 9 p.m. But this one is dated June 14th. The next one, latest news on Charleston Church massacre, is dated June 16, 2015. Uh, and that's national news, WDEF TV. The next one is also police Charleston Church shooting was a hate crime, dated June 15th. And here's another one, police searching for church shooter in Charleston, South Carolina, dated June 16, 2015. So all these were pre-written prior to the event. Oh, okay? yeah. Yep. So once again, they jumped the gun just like with Sandy Hook where um, a lot of, you know, Victoria Soto's Facebook page was created uh, December 10th, I believe. And uh, a couple of the charities, the web pages were created in November and prior to December 14th. So here we go. They jumped the yep. gun. You know, uh, apparently no one tells them that things on the internet are time stamped. And, um, <laughs> we, I think we could safely say that this is a, uh, fake stage psyop. Yeah. Well, I want, they'll just, uh, they'll just use this as an excuse to, you know, go for the gun grabs and, oh, yeah. and, and start the race war that they want. Oh Yeah. Well, they, I watched some of the news footage on CNN, and none of those people were crying. They were, you know, it was obvious that they were being put up to this to play the old, oh, you know, I lost somebody in a shooting, oh. And yeah. the fact is, nobody was crying. I mean, you know, if I, if I just got a call from the cops and they told me, you know, like, you know, a mother or a grandparent or an aunt, uncle or cousin 
uh, is dead and everything, I wouldn't even make, I wouldn't even be able to make it down there to even identify the body. I'd, I'd just collapse on the spot. And yet here these guys are the next morning all, you know, woo, you know. Well, you like, you could on. always tell it's fake when right away they're doing, inter- they're, you know, their loved one has been dead or killed. Killed, right? Yeah. yeah. And they're doing interviews on CNN, the Today Show. I mean, you know what I mean? Where's the grieving, you know? Yeah. 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 So, it's just, it's well, unreal. Well, uh, just remember, crisis actors are not professional actors. They, right, they, yeah. They pick these guys up off the street. Like, I think I've told you before, that place is right here in Denver. This is where they're headquartered. And uh, all you got to do is go in on the web and sign up, and then as soon as there's a crisis actor drill, they'll email you where you need to be, and... If it's out of state, they'll even pay for your plane ticket to to go wherever the event is. Well, and just real quick, I just wanted to talk about the other two psyops just real quick. Um, the other psyop, and I know this is a psyop, is the New York escape prisoners. Oh yeah, the, yeah. Okay, that's completely fake. Uh, that was probably done because Cuomo has got a criminal probe against them, and yep. uh, you know he wants to deflect on that. And just and everything about that story is like hinky, completely hinky. The other psyop, which is even weirder, is uh, Rachel Dol. Uh, oh my gosh! Yeah, oh. the NAACP <laughs> uh, president who had to resign because she's a white girl pretending to be black, and now and her parents came out against her. Why I don't know, you know, to out her, and now. Yeah. It's she's saying that she was forced into uh, making sex tapes. Yeah. So see, um, it's just this yeah. thing, you know, over a, a two week time, the story gets more twisted and sorted as it goes. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, did you see her half brother come out and admit that their parents are like total psychos and that they were homeschooled and were abused and everything? No, I missed that. So now there's another angle. Yeah. There's another angle, yeah. Yeah, their their parents are fundies, you know. But I mean, who knows? See, that's what I'm saying. Who? See, I, I, since that's, I think that's all staged and fake. They're trying to hit everything that they're against, like homeschooling, right? Yeah. So they're going to drag oh, yeah. that up, right? You see yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't get it. I mean, it's just it's bizarre. It's bizarre. Well, they're they're on a, these uh, power brokers in government and in the globalist community. They're they're on an end game. They know there's not much time left, and uh, they just want to smack everything as hard as they can, as fast when, as they when can. You, when it's, you say when people say that there's not much time left, for, like because I see this more and more people awakening to the injustices of the world, and you know we're waking up more and more and. Do you agree with me that they're trying to clamp down on everything? Oh yeah, yeah. There's uh, there's this mad uh, rush to uh, power, just total, uh, you know, just to lock everything down, to control everything, because they feel like they're losing control. Really, I I mean, if you hear some of these idiots talk in Europe, you won't hear this in the American media. But you go to the European media, and the globalists are afraid they're going to get nailed with pitchforks and torches any day now. Yeah, yeah. You know, funny enough, um, <laughs> remember in the 1920s when the when the stock market crash happened, and they said, "Oh, people were jumping out of windows." Yeah. You know, committing suicide. I'm starting to wonder, just like with the bank, you know, the banksters are getting off now. Maybe those people were had help going out. Those oh, windows. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I actually think the media was much more controlled then than it is today. I mean, today there's too many alternative media, the Internet and everything that they can't cover things like they used to be able to. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, every time these guys pull something, they get caught, like on these shootings, which are, you know, false flags. The thing the prisons, people don't realize in New York... I mean, those prisons have been there for decades, and I mean, you couldn't break out of there with Delta Force's help. I mean, they are, that's some of the most tightly secured prisons uh, in the world. And the way they claim they got out, it's like, oh, give me a break. What is this, uh, like out of a Robert Mitchum movie or something? It's crazy. Yeah, and there's no way that one guy, the bald guy maybe, but that other guy was way stocky looking. 
There's no yeah. way he could have fit through that pipe. No, no way. You know. Yeah. And by the way, when it comes to the drains in a lot of these prisons, um, uh, my cousin and I both worked in the prison system for about three months till we got tired of it and quit. All of your storm drains and everything have welded uh, grates over them. So you're not going to just go up there and use a spoon and dig around the welds and pop yourself out. It didn't work like that. That's why we have so few prison breaks. In fact, uh, anybody in the marshal's office um, or the U.S. prison systems will tell you if anybody is going to escape from county, state, or federal prison, it's going to be during transfers. That's where the escape is going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So anyway, so those are the three bull bleep stories, you know, uh, in the news. Just, I mean, who knows what else? I mean, there's probably others I haven't been paying attention, you know, too much, especially with, you know, Jade Helm. But yeah. uh, let's, um, you know, we talked about missing people. Do you want to, you want to get into more detail about your wife, and then go into the, uh, the other missing stuff that we that you were just going over? Sure. Well, sure. well it's up to you. What do you want to talk about? Well, since we're segueing into that, we can start off with her, and then you know I can give you an yeah, idea yeah, that's on. Yeah, that's a fascinating story. You know. Uh, yeah. Your wife, you know. Yeah. Well, she's never and, been found, right? I mean, she's never popped and, up. She's never popped up as far as anybody knows. I still have friends uh, in Hollywood and Los Angeles, and they have never seen her, seen her since this supposed divorce. Uh, never heard from her, and many of them were just as good of friends with her as they were me, and she just disappeared off the face of the earth. And, and is her family, is her mother still alive and all that? Oh, yeah. The old battle axe is still alive. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, believe me, uh, I don't. I, I would say that she's maybe a few steps down from Hillary Clinton, but I think they both would be contenders for Battle Axe of the Year award. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, my mother-in-law had, still does, has juice in Hollywood. I mean, with the studios and everything, you know. I mean, she's pretty much still the main supplier of equipment uh, for the studios and. Anytime you get a situation like that, you're going to have juice when you supply uh, the studios with equipment. It's like Lockheed Martin supplying the military with jets. That's why Lockheed Martin has got so much juice. It's, a, it's the same thing. You know, you would think that the studios would own their own cameras. You know what uh, I mean? They, they do on the smaller video-type cameras. Uh, they, own, they own those, like their studio cams, like your Sony video cameras. They own those. But when it comes to going out on the road uh, for their own location jobs, uh, Panavision does not allow uh, anybody to buy their cameras. Uh, you just lease them for the short term. And those that's the equipment that we lease to them uh, because we were an authorized Panavision dealer. Right. Uh, but, yeah, it's the, it's the only camera in the world you can't buy. Like I've, How- I've bought Aries. I've bought Eclairs. I bought Sony uh, video cameras, but that's the only camera in the world you can't buy is that one. And that's what we supplied, and we usually had to uh, clean them up and repair them before they went out on the road because once they were out on the road, there was no guarantee they would be anywhere near a Panavision dealer or something happened. So, Haven't they gotten away from using Panavision cameras making films now? With the, and, with the- and it, it depends on the director. Uh, some directors are going video now um, with the high def cams. You're getting such good uh, video, you really don't need Panavision. But there's there's holdouts. There's guys that are like, nope, they don't want nothing to do with video. I mean, they're just like groupies when it comes to film. It's got to be done on film, and and yeah. you know, and with the high def cams, I mean, you got to remember back in those days that was before high definition video and everything. And there was only a few companies out there that could supply equipment, and we were one of the major ones. We had a a bigger warehouse, and, you know, we could get deals. My uh, mother-in-law had such juice with the manufacturers that she could get, you know, money off cameras, off the list price, off the retail, and then pass that on to the uh, studios. And always, you know, equipment breaks, and you'd be amazed at how hard production crews can be on equipment. You know, we supplied everything. If you know anything about film, you know they use a thing called flags to bounce light on a movie set. Uh, those get torn up. Uh, there was a guy in our shop that used to repair those. Uh, he 
he could sew all that back together. Uh, I repaired C stands. That was one of my things. And so we were always doing that back and forth. So you were always having to go and get equipment, resupply it. Uh, back in those days with uh, film, you know, the magazines would get jammed. They would get dirty. I'd have to bring them in. We had a licensed crew that would repair uh, film magazines, that kind of thing. So we were always doing that. And uh, it's just one of those. It's just one of those things when you get an in like she did with the studios and and a lot of her juice came even before she bought that company you know she was a a new york model she hobnobbed around with everybody the theater people in new york the la crowd and everything and uh my father-in-law he sold a lot of real estate to a lot of big name people in california senators corporate execs so you know it's just the crowd they ran in so you know, that and mixing the Hollywood uh, supply company with it, you know, you end up, you know, hobnobbing around with these people. It just goes from one area to the other, so. All right, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's get into your, you know, basically what happened with your wife. Okay, um, as I've told you before, and I'll recap for the audience in case some of them haven't heard it, uh, m- my wife and I grew up together. Uh, my parents and her parents had known each other, uh, oh, going way back, I think early 60s. Actually, I think my mom met her dad before he was even married to my mother-in-law uh, in 59 or 60 or something like that. And um, so we grew up together. Uh, we spent summers together and everything. And uh, we had a lot of fun. They had numerous properties around the country, uh, Nashville, uh, Kentucky, Virginia, all kinds of places. They had a place in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, they had a place in Arlington, Virginia. So when I went to visit them, I got to go all over the country, and then they had their uh, place in Los Angeles. Um, but uh, to make a, a long story short, uh, her mother was big into alternative-type religions, her dad not so much. He, he is a Southern Baptist, but kind of became an atheist after years. But uh, He let his wife branch out and and get into alternative religions, and she got into Scientology, and uh, she pulled uh, her daughter in with it. And uh, I used to go visit them after he died uh, out in Los Angeles, and uh, my wife went to the Apple School. Uh, I don't think that school even exists anymore. I think it was shut down, Uh, but that's where she went to school, and... In her later years, she actually moved into a dormitory at the Apple School where they really started working on her. They had a hard time with her because she really didn't like this stuff. She was forced into her by her mother. Um, she finally, you know, dropped out of high school. I moved out there after I graduated high school in 85. We got married in 86. Um, there was always a lot of those idiots around her all the time because her family had money. And that's what this group is about, is about money, how they can get a hold of anybody, whether they're, you know, just a, a rich corporate executive, you know, like my father-in-law or a Hollywood celebrity or anyone else. If they've got money and they can get you in there, uh, they'll start tugging at your wallet as quick as they can. Well, we started noticing a lot of trouble even before both of us graduated from high school. Um, they already had access to her trust fund. How they got access to it, I don't know, uh, because it was a very strictly set up trust fund. And what happened was that uh, my wife got cut off at 14. Her mother said, you're not getting any more money, which was illegal. She couldn't do that. Uh, But she did it. And so my mother was given her money, her future daughter-in-law money to live, and it was a, it was just a horrible mess, and it, it made us both mad, and it caused a lot of divisions. And I think my mother-in-law finally got to the point to where I was public enemy number one. Anyways, this went on for a number of years. She got us involved in her film company, you know, helping out with the rentals and helping out with sales. We sold things, too, uh, things that were one-off use items. We really didn't – we liked film. We loved Hollywood, but we didn't – want to be salesman, (laughs) you know, neither one of us did. She wanted to sing. She had a great voice. Her mother wouldn't let her. 87, uh, she dropped out of high school in 87. Things got really nasty after that. In 88, 
her mother told her, and well, told us both. I was in the room when she told her. She goes, you will never get that money. She goes, you're never getting your trust fund. It's not going to happen. And I'll tell you, an all-out war started. Um, I do know in late 88, I went to the Celebrity Center with her, and this is one of my pet peeves, and people might see it on my website, or I may have even mentioned on Facebook. If I ever have my way, there are two men in this world who will be making love to Bubba in the prison shower, considering what I have on both of them. And both of them are Scientologists, and they're both actors, and that's John Travolta and Tom Cruise. Uh, John Travolta is one that really pushed my mother-in-law into Scientology. He got her into it. She wanted to go into it, but he's the one that really convinced her to start handing over money. Um, he had seen her in New York when she was a model. I, I'm not going to make any allegations. I don't know that they ever had an affair. I don't think they did. Uh, but I know people will question me on that and say, hey, do you think they had an affair? I don't know. I don't want to know. I never did know. I mean, she kept a lot of her personal stuff private after my father-in-law died she did a lot is he, of he is he strictly gay or bisexual or what i mean what does he oh, know he's he's as gay as liberace the only reason he's married to kelly preston is to keep his fans happy that's all right. that's all all right he's he's had a gay lover my my uh uh wife and i were actually on the set of his movie when he did the uh you know the old cowboy movie down there Urban and, Cowboy, uh, yeah. Yeah, Urban Cowboy. And my mother-in-law drug us down there to the set. And, you know, I met him. He seemed nice. I, I, You know, I can't see anything about him back then. I can say a lot about him about now because I have the evidence. Back then, he just seemed like a halfway decent Hollywood actor. I was like, okay, hi, yeah, let, you know. And uh, But I can tell you that when I was at the Celebrity Center, and this was in late 87, probably early, may have been twice, there was two times, 87 and 88, and I was sitting in the back with what's called repressive subjects, is what we're called. And we are the non-Scientology uh, spouses of Scientologists. We are considered the enemy. So we always had to sit in the back of the room when they were having one of their little things, and Tom Cruise is up there, and this guy, I mean, I, 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 you know what I, you know what I wish? I wish he screws up so bad in public that all his fans walk away from him and he never does a movie again. Because what he said about non-Scientologists who were married to Scientologists, he said right there, and he was looking at all of us in the back row, and he says, anybody who does not accept Scientology does not accept our way of doing things and what we believe and what we think can make a better person is our enemy. And he was looking at all of us. And he knew darn well because my wife knew him and had been to his house. And I was like, you punk, you SOB. And I I always did think he was addressing it to me personally, though. What, there what like do they call – there's a name for it, though, because um, I saw him in a video where he said, oh, wouldn't it be great if there were no – is that what the term is? Non? What is it? Well, they call them uh, suppressive persons, SPs. They call them SPs. Yes, that's it. SPs. Yes. That's what that's what we're called that's as right. SPs. And I was very, very angry about that. And the other thing that I'm angry about with John Travolta because I was in the room when this happened once, so I know what's going on here. And they did this to my wife, and it almost killed her. I was in the room when they were doing this purification rundown. They make you drink lots of water and stupid vitamins. They did this to her, and I mean, her face started turning red, and I was telling them, I said, guys, I said, you know, she can't take this. I said, this isn't going to work. They ushered me out of the room. Five minutes later, they call in one of their doctors, and at that point, I walked in, and I said, listen, I'm going to go find a phone in this place, and I'm going to call my mom's cousin, who's an assistant district attorney under Gil Garcetti, and everyone in this room is going to prison. I said, get your hands off her, get away from her, we are leaving. And she was able to stand, and I got her out of the room, got her in the car. I took her to Cedar sinai and they said she was dehydrated and was very close to stroking out, very close. Um, this is what John Travolta did to his son, Jet. And this has been admitted. It's in the court docs. And this is why John Travolta had his son cremated in the Bahamas. 
My aunt, who used to live in the Bahamas, will tell you if you think an American cop is the best money can buy, you've never been to the Bahamas yet because everybody down there can be bought. That's why Hollywood celebrities go down there when they really want to party in style because the cops won't say anything like they do here in America. When I heard that he had put his son in a hot bath with sea salt and had strobing lights in the bathroom for a child that he later admitted was epileptic, I'm sorry. There are a lot of people in law enforcement, and, and even Nancy Grace came out and said that that was either criminally negligent, homicide, or it was just plain murder one. Was his wife, was his wife there, too, at the time? Oh, yeah. I don't remember. Yeah, she was there. She was staying by herself in another So basically, they just wanted to get rid of him because he was autistic and he was going to be a drain on them. Right. And by the way, anybody who is autistic or has um, epilepsy or any kind of disease like that is, is considered the enemy because those people can't be purified according to Scientology. And do you know that there's been a number of children over the years that have been killed by their Scientology parents? Uh, because they were considered beyond help. It's, wow. in the, it's in criminal files. The only reason John Travolta never got arrested is because he's a Hollywood actor. If him and Kelly Preston had been two white bimbos, you know, from New Jersey or South Side L.A., they'd both be in prison for life right now. I guarantee it. Unreal. So, yeah, so anyways, that's my grief there. I also think to a certain extent he may have been involved, and there was a number of people that were involved trying to push me out the door. I can't, uh, Cruz I know for sure, but uh, Travolta, he was always, like I said, I can't say he had the hots for my mother-in-law or they were doing anything, because I don't think they were, but they were good friends, and I know my mother-in-law wanted me gone. I know Scientology wanted me gone, so it wouldn't surprise me if Travolta was with that in crowd saying, yeah, let's, you know, let's, you know, let's hand him his hat and show him the door. It wouldn't surprise me. But I don't like either one of them, not because maybe they don't like me or try to push me out the door. That's fine. I mean, we all deal with that life where somebody doesn't like us for some reason and says, hey, get lost. I don't like them because I think that they have helped murder people. I think that they have uh, most people do not know this. Tom Cruise is a high-level auditor for Scientology. And do you know where he was in the mid-90s when a big crisis was going on in Clearwater, Florida? No, where? He was auditing Lisa McPherson right before she died. When you say auditing, what, what, is, what entails auditing? Okay, with auditing... And this is kind of funny because it's, it's, if you look at the IRS term for auditing and then just add religion and, and hokey pokey science fiction in it, kind of the same. The idea of auditing is to determine your real feelings and your real motivations. And after you go through, through certain levels of classes, and I had gone through some of the basic classes of Scientology and then gave up. I was like, this is crazy. You know, forget this. But what they will do is after every level of classes that you take, they will audit you to see how much of that information you took in and whether you still have some of that negativity that is keeping you from going to the next level. And they audit you after every level. Now, guys like uh, Tom Cruise only audit people at the highest levels. They don't come down to the lower levels. And he, I, I mean, he... The stories I've heard, he is pretty brutal in the auditing sessions. Uh, people that didn't flip out like Lisa McPherson and end up dead, other people ended up walking out of Scientology, crying their eyes out with empty pocketbooks after he got done with them. And so you understand why he is so critically uh, taken to task to this day. People don't understand. They think, oh, well, it's just because he's this crazy Scientology actor. No, it's because people have had personal experience with him. And the talk that I've heard and, and some of the, the uh, reports taken by the police down there in Clearwater say this guy is like a sadistic freak. Really? Wow. Yes. Well, look at Katie Holmes. Look how he ruined her. That, that girl's a total waste now to Hollywood. I, I mean, how, how can they ever use her in a movie again? She she walks around like a zombie. Mm. You know, 
And I remember when that story came out, her, her parents almost collapsed of a heart attack when they found out she was with him. They said that was totally out of character for her to go after older guys. Totally after, out of character. They said they had never seen that from her before. You got to wonder why he would met, like, why pick on a, a Hollywood woman? Why doesn't he just, you know, marry a, a, a normal woman and just hide her away? Or pretend. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. He's got to be married to an actress. He's, every woman well, he's been with is an actress. Right. And I think the reason for that is, is the way Hollywood likes to control things. If you bring in a non-actress, you bring in some woman off the bus from Kansas City, and you put a woman, an ordinary off-the-street woman with somebody like Cruz, Cruz is going to lose control of his secret life. He's also secretly a homosexual, by the way. Yeah. And uh, I which think... He, which he denies completely. Well, I, 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 was, I was a personal witness to that at, at a party um, at Donald Sutherland's house. Um, Cruz was there, and he kissed a guy. And I mean, you know, I mean, you know, it's Hollywood, you know, but it's... <laughs> You know, right. I mean, sorry. I mean, you know, if you're gay, you're gay. That's fine by me. I'm not going to throw a fit about it. I, I don't care. But, you know, don't marry a woman to cover up your lifestyle. That, that's all I say, you know. Yeah. And who was his first wife? Uh, Mimi gorgeous. Rogers. Mimi Rogers. I mean, my God, she was just oh. a knockout, right? Yeah. And, well, we, and he we would had, tell her, oh, the reason why, you know, I, I wanted to be a priest when I was younger and. That's why, uh, you know. Yeah. Well, I'm you do know she, she told us the secret one time at a dinner party. Uh, she didn't tell me. She told my wife uh, that uh, one of the reasons why she just kind of fell out with him is because he's sterile. He can't have children. And there are no way in the world that the Katie Holmes' children are his. I'm sorry. It ain't happening. No. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Cause, why I do mean, you think he's sterile? Uh. I think with him, when it, when he was younger, I believe drugs may have played a part in it. I mean, there were some stories about him that, you know, he was a heavy partier when he was young. He he denies it. He he has this story that he basically was, you know, Mr. Middle Class America. Nobody's buying it. You know, he was just, he was too hyped up from a young age. Everyone thought he had to be riding the coke train. He had to be. Well, if you ever saw him in the movie, I think one of his first movies was Taps. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, where he's like, it's beautiful. He's, you know, he's in the in the that room with the that heavy machine gun, just mowing mm-hmm. everyone down, and he's like, it's beautiful, man. It's beautiful, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think that was yeah. one of his first movies. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. There's just you know, there's too many too many cover ups with him and Travolta, and I think they're. I think that there it's it's coming un, unraveled with both of them, and you know it's it's one of those things that well, who's you know, that actress that uh, <laughs> she just left? Um, she used to be on that show. I'm bad with names. Mm, so am I. I can't remember who it was. Was she the one right after Katie Holmes, or was there another one after it, that? It just happened like a couple months ago. She she left yeah. Scientology, and then they made a big stink about it, and you know. Um. Oh, she was on that show, The King of Queens, right? Okay. You know that show, The King of Queens. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And she was on The View, I think. Okay, I'm trying. I'm trying to think. I, I can see a face, but I can't remember a name. Oh. Let's look up on the IMDb. Okay, so. Hold on. King of Queens. And then uh, segue into your wife disappearing, because that's what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Leah Remney, that's it. Ah, that's the one, yeah. Yeah, Leah Remney, yeah. 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 yeah, I thought she would never leave. She was so hardcore into it. I mean, she was at a, uh, she was at a higher level than my wife was. I think my wife was OT. OT1 and she was like OT3 or something like that and she was just back in the day it was just the thing you know and and I was like oh my god how can you even think that way I mean they they pounded on her pretty hard over the years right but, but she's uh, out now so yeah I mean there's yeah. hope you know yeah 
Yeah, there's hope yeah. being out, but a lot of these people that do get out, they're ruined for life. They're financially broke. They're emotionally scarred. Um, I guess if you can get out alive, I guess that's the thing, because there's a lot of people that don't. And that's the problem. And that leads us back up to, like I said, around 87, 88, when things were getting weird. We we know that they were monitoring the house because they knew that my mom was giving her money and they were going back to her mom and we were I was getting ripped for it. And I said, well, you know, she's got to have some money. You just can't cut her off completely. That's not even legal. And, you know, and I got read the riot act and everything. So I know they had the house bug. That's very common with this crowd to do that. But where we really saw the trouble was we knew that they were coming in all the time while we weren't there. And it was, you couldn't prove it. So they, and they had to have a key because there was no door jar. There was no lock jimmied or a window jimmied. So they had to have gotten a key somehow. And that's not hard for them to do. Uh, with all their front companies, they may have had a locksmithing company that made it may have made a key for them. But I, I, di I distinctly remember all through 88, we were getting pretty paranoid. Uh, I was like, you know, what are they going to do? And we were thinking, well, you know, maybe, maybe nothing. Maybe we're just paranoid and let's let it go. So we kind of went back to our life and partying and things. And then in 89, that is when everything uh, fell apart. Uh, first of all, we knew that they were taking money out of the trust fund. We went to my mom's cousin. He said that he would look into it. He was very worried when he contacted us. He said, this is a, a lot bigger than I thought. He says, uh, you know, he says, I'm going to have to take a walk up to the state attorney's office. He says, this, this is a lot bigger. He says, yeah, there's money gone, but he says, um, there's some muscle involved in this. And he says, there's some very heavyweight people involved. Um, he says, you know, uh, I'm going to have to go upstairs, as he called it, to, to get help on this investigation. Um, I didn't hear from him for a while. And I, the one thing that I noticed was that she was starting to really buck them. She didn't want to go to any more of their auditing classes, didn't want to go to any of the classes at all. And then right before she disappeared, and this was probably – first week of August, if, if I remember right. I, I'm sure it was the first week of August because we'd gone through July, 4th of July, done all our things there. And uh, my mom's cousin had called me back and, and he said that he said the state attorney general said that there were so many investigations going on into this group that he says, you're, you're going to have to fall in underneath that investigation. And he says, I don't know when they're going to let us get to it. He says, there is so much going on. He told me that there were at least a hundred criminal investigations going on into Scientology and some of its very wealthy members that they were ripping off the middle class and the poor members. And he said, this is a nightmare. So he says, you're going to have to have patience with me. He says, I don't know when we can get to this, but he says, if you feel threatened in any way, he says, my suggestion is to take her and go back to Colorado. And then he says, maybe we can, figure out something from there. But he says, you know, do you have a gun? And I says, well, she does. She has one of her dad's guns. And he says, just keep it handy. He says, if you have to use it, as long as you're inside the house, you're not going to get in any trouble. He says, just let them break in first, then use it. He says, don't chase them outside or anything. But, you know, if yeah. they come in, he says, use it if they come in the house. And I got kind of worried because I was like, what the hell did he find out that he is telling us to keep you know the handgun. Do, hand. do you regret that you didn't go to? Do you regret that you didn't get the hell out of there and go to Colorado? Yeah, I, I I still bash my head into the wall to this day for not just grabbing her, putting her in my Camaro, and taking off, leaving all that that stupid house, leaving all that there. That was her dad's house, and her mom always razzed us for that. You know, and, oh, you guys should get your own house, and I'm like, how? You know, you know, I'm even working. so. Even when you were working with the in Hollywood, you know, fixing that all that equipment. With the business, you didn't make any decent money to, you know. Well, you know I, was what making, I, mean? like, I was making ten dollars an hour, and that's decent money here in Colorado in the '80s, but not out there. I mean, that. Oh yeah, that's it. That's all you're making. Yeah, ten dollars an hour. Oh, she was a tight wad. I mean, the techs that had the big degrees, yeah, she paid them. But you know, I, 
you know, I'd, uh, <laughs> I didn't even have an associate's degree yet. I was still working on it. And so I think she felt that she could justify, you know, ripping me off, even though the guys were training me to work on equipment. It wasn't like I was, you know, some burger flipper or something, you know. Yeah. I was fixing equipment that took training. I had certificates for, you know, different equipment. But, yeah, she wouldn't pay me nothing. But, yeah, I regretted it. I wanted so bad to go at that point. I wanted to get out of there. I was like, we got to go. And I, I kept say, telling her, I said, you know, maybe we should just go back to Colorado. I said, we can live with my mom till we can, you know, get jobs there. Um, you know, I said, I want to finish my degree. We can do something. And she's like, no. She goes, I've got aunts, uncles, and cousins here. Uh, I really don't want to leave. And and she kept saying, Bill, I don't think they're going to do anything. She goes, I, you know, she goes, I, you know, they may be a little over the top, but she goes, they're not going to do anything crazy. And I kept thinking, after what she had seen herself, how could she, I don't know, maybe they'd just gotten her so brainwashed themselves, they thought, she thought, you know, nothing would happen. You know, we've seen this before in society where, you know, people ignore danger signs, and then all of a sudden, boom, out of nowhere, something bad happens. Right, yeah. You know. Yeah, and when you're dealing with psychopaths. Oh, yeah. I mean, when you're dealing with people who just do not fear the law or oh, fear no, justice. Yeah. No, they have no fear of the law because they have their people in law enforcement. That's right, part, yeah. part of what you do is they infiltrate everything. They infiltrate the IRS, the FBI. You know, they that that's one of the things why my cousin, who's an FBI agent, says that that's one of the things they ask you now, even though it's supposed to be illegal under federal law, is do you have any religious affiliation? And they always ask that because as soon as it comes up like Scientology or – uh, way of the path or children of the God, they turn you down right then and there because all those cults I just mentioned try to infiltrate the U.S. government all the time. Of course, yeah, I would, yeah, yeah. And you never so, know, once someone is in, like, once someone is, is, go, is in government and then they could step into it, you know, or get into it, you know, then what do you mm -hmm. do? Yeah, wow. yeah. Once they got a position in there, then they can start giving their buddies information. That's what they were. Uh, that's what they were doing in the '80s. Um, they had what was called the Guardian Office at the time in Scientology, and um, we found out that they had a file on us when it changed and became this new organization. They now call it the Office of, of Special Activities, and I'm like, oh yeah, OSA. That's really great. But they had a file on us going back to when we were in junior high. And I was like, why do you have a file on two kids? You know, what in the world are you people thinking? And that was part of the disclosure in 87 when they got in so much trouble. Uh, they had to disclose all these files. And, you know, at the time we we're thinking, you got files on kids? What kind of creeps are you, you know? And I was like, ick, you know. But... Um, you know, she kind of ignored it. She kind of blew it off. And Hold on. If if anyone wants to call in uh, or ask any questions in the chat, 716-745-4266. That's 716-745-4266. And if anyone has any questions in the chat, I'm looking at the chat room, so uh, you can ask uh, William Zabel uh, a question. William, why don't you, you want to give uh, a plug to your books and your info? Your uh, Facebook yeah. page or, yeah, or, and your yeah. YouTube page and all that? Yeah, um, the I don't remember the exact uh, thing for the YouTube page, but if you put in Billy Bedlam 66, it'll, it'll be the first thing that pops up. Um, I've got some stuff up there on YouTube. I've got a fictional science fiction show. I've just done one episode. Uh, I've got a video up there that's rants and raves that, basically goes into economics and how we're all getting screwed and such like. Um, if you go to uh, uh, my website, thephantomchasers.org, you can see the book on Columbine. Uh, the last chapter right now is sitting right here on the, on the desktop. Uh, just went through and did grammar checking and everything. Uh, that should be up there in a few days. Uh, I've got some more video that you can also see on that website about Columbine, uh, students and cops and teachers uh, talking about that. That's a whole other day. show we got to get into. That's a whole, yeah. that's a whole other show we got to do. Columbine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Is that it? 
Uh, yeah, that's it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. You are listening. Uh, hold on. Let me just get the call letters here. You are listening to WCJV Digital Broadcasting, Youngstown, New York, CJ Mars Radio. I'm Mike Gray, your host. This is Parlay, and we have with us William Zabel, who is uh, regaling us with uh, – I shouldn't say regaling us uh, – telling us his story of a uh, pretty heavy subject. I mean, his wife – you're, how long were you married to your wife? I mean, you knew her. I mean, could you imagine? Here you know this woman, this girl, your whole life, right? I mean, you grew up together. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then one day you you get married. She's like your, uh, you know, your, your sweethearts, right? Since, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and you come home one day and poof, she's just disappeared. And, and her mother yeah. her mother didn't shed a tear, huh? No. not Well, her mother had to be behind this. Uh, she was the the way this worked out, and this is what happened in, in August of '89. I, I felt like something was wrong when I drove up because there were too many cars there at the house, and we only had two cars: her BMW and my Camaro. We didn't have anything else, and her mom never visited. Her mom was a witch, and I saw her mom's car, and I thought, okay, what is mommy dearest up to now? And I walked in and. There were there was a lawyer there. He had like a paralegal assistant with him, and I know there was two Scientology heavyweight muscle guys standing back by the the back patio doors. And my mother-in-law basically said, "You're out of here." And I go, "What do you mean I'm out of here?" And she goes, "Well, she goes. She's decided she wants to go down another path." And I said, "No, no, 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 no." I said, "This, this is all bull crap." I said, "What is going on here?" And I said, why don't you let me talk to her? We'll find out what this is. And uh, my mother-in-law said, well, she's not here. Um, She has decided that she needs some space. And I said, that's not like her. I said, I want to see her right now. And the lawyer said, you know, he says, there's a lot of things here that have been going on. And uh, he says, I I think that if you read this report, he says, I think you'll see that, um, uh, you could be in a little bit of trouble here down the road. And I said, what kind of trouble? And he said, well, we've got booze and and drugs here. I said, hey, the drugs were pills from pharmacy for her. They were pain pills. When she fell off the skateboard, she went over the side of one of those walls, you know, that kids skateboard on, and at 17 tore her knee up. I said, that's what that is. I said, we have never touched street drugs we drank, and, she, and he goes, well, yes, but she is underage. I said, do you know who was feeding her the booze? I said, when she was over at her aunt and uncle's house when we were over there, 17 years old, feeding her booze, I said, go serve papers on them, not me. I said, by the way, I'm 21. I live in this house. I can legally have booze, and she can legally drink it as long as she don't walk out on the street. I talked to the cops. They told me that. And he goes, well, we have lots of other stuff here. And I go, well, name it. And he goes, well, this, you know, going back to when you were teenagers, you two messing around. I said, yeah, two underage teenagers necking, giving each other tongue and feeling each other up. Yeah, big crime. I said, we were both underage. I said, we're both underage. You're going to have a hard time, you know, trying to convince any judge that I should and, be prosecuted. And by the way, anything. you're married at this point, right? I mean, yeah, I'm married at this point. Well, what, is this, what is this clown doing? He's bringing stuff up from 10 years ago, you know, when yeah. we're like 12, 13 years old, you know, it's like, give right. me a break. It's like, buddy, you're talking about my wife here. Yeah, and he's going on. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I said, first of all, I said, how do you even know all this stuff? Well, you know, I found out later that they had been watching us since we were young. They were taking note of everything. And uh, he says, I want you to sign this paper. He says, your stuff is already packed. You're ready to go. And I said, I'm not going anywhere. And um, and I said, I'm not signing anything. So I went over and I picked up the phone. I called my mom's cousin. And it took me a while to get through. Uh, he had just come out of court. And uh, he says, I already know about it. I've been trying to get a hold of you at work. And I said, they called me home from work. I said, that's why I'm not there. And I said, What are we going to do? He says, Bill, there is so much juice behind this. He says, take your stuff and get out. He says, I've already talked to the sheriff's department. They're going to start investigating this. But he says, right now, he says, I personally think you're in a lot of danger. He says, don't stay in that house. He says, you do know that's not even her house. I said, it's part of the estate. 
I said, it's in her dad's name. It'll be transferred to her name when she turns 25 and we get the trust fund. She says, doesn't matter. It's still technically under the mother's headship. And she's the executor of the trust fund. He says, believe me. He says, don't push this. He says, get out of there. We'll deal with it later. And I said, he wants me to sign this form. And he says, don't sign that. He says, whatever you do, don't sign whatever they want you to sign. I said, it looks to me like divorce papers. And he says, he says, unless her name's on there, don't sign it. And uh, I went back and I, I took the phone and went over and looked at it. I said, there's no signature on there. He says, don't sign it. Well, eventually they made me sign a non-disclosure agreement before I left. And um, basically because of her connection to the studios and celebrities and things like that, they said, you know, sign this non-disclosure. I think it was good for like 10 years or something like that, that I wouldn't, you know, talk about anything for 10 years. And I put my stuff in my car. Uh, my cousin who had just moved out there went over to his house and stayed with him for the night. Next morning, my mom's cousin came over uh, with an L.A. County Sheriff's deputy, and he took a statement from me and everything and says, um, uh, was there any allegations by her? I said, no. I said, we have always been happy even as kids and as adults. I said, this is a scam by my mother-in-law and her Scientology friends. This is nothing else. Well, no allegations were ever leveled against me. You know, I smacked the wife around or anything like that. No cheating, no nothing, no allegations. Just this stuff that we both did as kids, which wouldn't amount to anything in a court of law. No judge in the world would allow two teenagers, you know, getting drunk at an aunt and uncle's house as any kind of legal grounds for anything when it happened almost 10 years ago. You know, they're going to be like, no, this is, uh, this is crap. But anyways, my mother called my cousin and put me on the phone with her. And my mom's like, you have got to come home. He says, she says, I told you never to trust her. I told you never to move out there to talk her to moving in here, coming back to Colorado with you uh, to come here. And she goes, uh, she goes, I've been talking uh, to some people I know. She goes, they called the cops out there. The cops said it's best that if I, that I left for now until their investigation is over. They've got my statement. They know what's going on. But I, it sounded to me like even the cops were scared at that point. I, and trust me, people, you have no idea what this organization is like. You think this is some cult living in a bus out in the desert? Uh-uh. These guys got juice and they've got money. And it wasn't until years later that I started going to groups that dealt with ex-Scientologists that I found out just what kind of juice they had, even in L.A. And uh, so, yeah, I left and came back here. And the thing about it was was her name never did appear on any paperwork for a divorce. They, they sent me a paper, and my mom looked at it. She gave it to a local lawyer here, and he said, this isn't even a divorce paper. He says, I don't even know what this is. Uh, he's saying, so, he said, they're saying something about a contract that you're now let loose from this contract. You no longer uh, need to have anything to do with her or mother or family. He says, what the hell did you sign? He says, a prenup. And I said, no, there was never a prenup. There was nothing. We got legally married in California. He says, let me go check their uh, paperwork out there, see if anybody's filed divorce paperwork. There was nothing filed. Well, anyways, when LAPD and the LA County Sheriff's Department both showed up, the house that we lived in was empty. My mother-in-law had gone to Europe on an extended vacation with some of her Scientology friends and my mother-in-law's family, I mean, they took the fifth. They didn't want to hear anything. Now, the thing is, they never put out an all points bulletin for her as a missing person. Um, the police never did uh, do any kind of sweep. They did talk to the neighbors on either side of us who said they were normal people as far as we know. There was never anything and there was never anything to suggest that she had ever popped up in LA and any kind of a legal thing. Uh, when her time came to, uh, to inherit the trust fund, she turned 25. That trust fund never rolled over into her name. It sat there in her mom's name, still as executor to this day. And from what I've heard in LA, that is illegal. The recipient has got to take control of the trust fund. And then if they want to, they can roll it over into their others, uh, into their own trust fund but it can't stay in the executor's name. It can't do that. And it has to this day. Her mother still has control of all the money and the businesses. And I found out later there was more than just the film company involved. She had other businesses. She had huge stock 
uh, in in uh, um, uh, Universal Studios, uh, 20th Century Fox, uh, Paramount Pictures. She 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 was using that trust fund to invest in all these companies. She had to be because even though she was a model, I don't think she made more than you know a half a million to a million in her whole life as a model. So she didn't have the money to be doing this. I mean, her husband did, but he didn't leave her with that much. He, uh, I think he left her with a million dollars, two million at most, and maybe a couple of houses and some cars, but the rest of it was left to my wife. So she had to be using the trust fund to invest in all these uh, studios and all these other companies. So do you think that maybe she ba- she like uh, Baker acted or committed to your wife and put her in a loony bin, drugged her up, and was, <laughs> she's in some kind of private, you know? Well, I do I do know this, and this is very typical of, of Scientology to do this, um, is what they will do is they have a thing called um, um, they had these RPF centers or, yeah, Rehabilitation Force, if I remember right, was the name of them. Rehabilitation Project Force, that was the name of them. And they had one out by Hellendale uh, in California. Um, they had another one uh, in Palm Beach. And then, of course, they had that one in Argentina that I actually went down there and looked at that and, you know, basically got led away from the facility by... Scientology uh, bodyguards and uh, security guards, as well as Argentinian police. Um, I have found talking to ex-Scientologists who had spent time in these facilities, uh, they made it very clear that they were grabbed the same way that my wife was probably grabbed. She was probably at home when I left. They probably walked in, told her, you know, you're having problems. We need to sort out the issues. And uh, if she didn't go with them willingly, they probably grabbed her and took her by force. And uh, the neighbors never said anything a- about seeing her leave. Of course, you know, they they work, you know, they're full-time working people. But, you know, my mom's cousin had talked to the neighbors, and one lady that was home said she never saw anything, but she wasn't looking out the window. But she says there was no commotion from the house that morning. There was nothing. So she says, I wouldn't have looked out the window anyways. Uh, but several people have said that they had been taken by surprise in their own homes by Scientologists that it, uh, had keys. And this would have been the guardian office because they were known as the dirty tricks department of Scientology. And, uh, they would have had keys to the house. We knew they had keys. And several ex members have told me that they were grabbed from behind. And then the next thing they know, they're in a facility halfway across the country and they're told they're not leaving. And that is what a lot of uh, ex-Scientologists think happened to my wife. And some of them were in these RPF centers. Sometimes one lady was in there from the time she was like 14 uh, for 10 years till she was 24 and she escaped. My God. Yeah. So I'll tell you what, you I, bring me in a place like that, I'm setting a fire inside the building. Oh, yeah. And I can imagine yeah. she gave them trouble. She wouldn't have gone easy. And if she could have gotten to her gun, I would have come home to a bunch of dead people. So they had to have taken her by surprise because, you know, she, she knew how to shoot that thing. You know, we'd gone to the range. She knew how to – She, I mean, she wasn't like a professional marksman, but, you know, she was better than your typical housewife. If they'd come through the door, she could aim straight enough to hit them. So yeah. it had to have been a surprise attack, that's all. But everything in the house looked good when I got there. So either they cleaned it up or they were able to take her in such a way that she couldn't cause a commotion. Wow. And I'm finding out that I am not uh, special in any way in regards to this. There are literally hundreds of spouses worldwide, not just in America and not just Scientology type spouses, but spouses who have had, you know, their wives or husbands and other types of cults that have encountered the same thing. And they come home and their spouse is missing and then boom, that's it. They never see him again. So I'm nothing unusual, I found out. I found out that there is a lot of this going on worldwide, not just here in America. Uh, and and so where does the mo- where's the mother-in-law now? Still oh, she, in California? She, oh, she's still in California. 
Um, her her address. <laughs> you, I Is she can't on Facebook? Find, <laughs> no, no. I looked I looked her up. She's not on Facebook. She's not on Twitter. She's not on anything. She's smart. She knows how to stay under the radar. Yeah. Um, she always did. And I'm like, you witch. I mean, I, I mean, uh, my father in law's family always hated her. As soon as they met her, I remember his uncles, his aunts, his cousins all saying, "Ah, oh, get rid of her." You know, ah, she's no good. I mean, they knew from the get-go she was she was trouble. They knew it, and everyone told him not to marry her. I think even my grandmother told him because my grandmother had met him long before uh, he maybe married her. Maybe she morphed into Chris Kardashian. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Yeah. You never know. I know she's had plastic surgery over the years. I do yeah, know that. There you, go. you know, <laughs> and it could be she's tried to change her look enough so even people in L.A. won't recognize her. But I don't think she goes out. I remember back in the day, she always had people that would go and get her groceries, uh, go wash her car for her, gas up her car. Uh, I mean, th- she was like the extreme of, of, of cult-like people. I mean, she the only place she would go is, you know, to hang out with her Hollywood friends and, and to the Scientology auditing sessions. But uh, she wouldn't go much place anywhere else. You would never catch her out on Rodale Drive shopping, ever. Hey, who was that person you said McPherson? Because um, I'm not Ma- familiar with the name. Who Lisa died? McPherson. Uh, she yeah, who, died who in 19, uh, She died in 1996 down in Clearwater, Florida. She was a not a high-level Scientologist. She might not have even made it to the OT level. She might have been OT1. And like I said, Cruz was the one auditing her. Uh, I think it was the night before at the Scientology headquarters there, and she started having a fit and left the auditing session. The next day, he left and went back to L.A., and it was probably around noon that day that she was totally tripped out. She got out of her car, stripped naked, and dropped over from a stroke right there on the spot. And they took her... Uh, They tried to take her to the hospital, but Scientology intercepted the ambulance and redirected it uh, to their celebrity center where they claim they had their own clinic. And she died in their uh, custody. This is in Clearwater, Florida, you're saying? Yep. Yep. They completely control the entire city. How the hell can they – how could they reroute an ambulance? Because they own the city council, they own the cops, they own the fire department. I've been down there. They own everything. Okay, so basically, wherever, whatever town or city they are in, they kind of take it over, right? If they can, if they can, if they, they can, tried yeah. this. Uh, they tried this in Germany, and the Germans gave them the boot. They tried to take That's over right. Frank. They tried to take over Frankfurt, and the Germans said, "You get the hell out and get out now." Yeah, yeah. Thank God. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez, I'll tell you, man. I mean, <laughs> look at Philip Seymour Hoffman. You want to talk about, you know, oh yeah, an actor who portrays their their savior. You know, he portrays all Ron Hubbard in that movie, The Master, and then mm-hmm. within a year, he's dead. Yep. You know, there there are so many deaths surrounding uh, Scientology. And, you know, I want to make it very clear. People always say, well, it sounds like Bill's always just berating religion. Hey, I grew up a Christian. I still believe in God. But to me, religion is a personal thing. It's not something you sell the masses. It's not something you use mind control on. And the thing that I try to get through to people is anytime you get organized religion and you get money and politics behind it, Somebody somewhere or a bunch of somebody's is going to either get hurt or killed or both. Yeah, amen to that. Yeah. And uh, I just love this. I, I, I know people berate, berated me last time we did a show oh, on – Oh, hey, on, it's, it's break time. we got to take a break. Okay. We're going to take just a, a quick break, and we'll be right back. You are listening to WCJV Digital Broadcasting, Youngstown, New York. Hey, you there. Yeah, you. Watching the ghost hunting show on TV? I know. 
What are you doing now? Looking at something you've seen on a website? Trying to get the latest ghost gadget? We'll stop that. Let's try something different. It's called research. This is Frank Lee, host of Paranormalities and Ponderings, here on the CJ Morris Radio Network, every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. Tune in and let's learn together. Do I know everything? Far from it. But I'm bringing some great informative guests so we can learn all we can together. I'll see you Tuesday on cjmarsradio.com. Hey everybody, this is Roger Bell, host of Half Past Dead Paranormal Radio on the CJ Mars Radio Network. Be sure to join us every Monday night at 8 Eastern for some interesting paranormal conversation with some awesome guests and a laugh or two. Half Past Dead Paranormal Radio is back. Okay, we are back, and you are listening to Parlay. This is uh, WCJV Digital Broadcast in Youngstown, New York, CJ Mars Radio. I'm your host, Mike Gray, and we're back with William Zabel. Hey, William, you there? Oh, yeah. All right, we got the callers out. That's good. And we were talking about uh, your poor wife uh, either being abducted or uh, 
I'd like to, I would pre- I would prefer to think she's you know was abducted and just you know yeah well kind of sequestered she, somewhere you know but uh, she, yeah she wasn't she wasn't going to leave me everybody in my family knew that I mean when you grow up with somebody you know I mean yeah you at least say goodbye and she would have I would imagine she would have there would have been an uh, a build up to her leaving like you know you guys fighting and you know yeah yeah. yeah. I mean, if she was going to leave anything, she would leave her family and, and run as fast as she could. I found out years later, uh, I was at a conference up in uh, Oregon, and it dealt with cults and the CIA and mind control. And this lady had heard me talking about my wife, and she goes, oh, your wife is a Scientologist. And I said, yeah. And uh, she goes, it's really strange. She goes, you know, um, I researched this for years, and she started telling me about all of these people that had seemingly normal lives and no trouble in the marriage, no trouble with the family. And one day, and she goes, it's not just one spouse, but sometimes it's both spouses that disappear. And she goes, in a couple of cases, she researched the whole family, children, parents, and all vanished without a trace. So she goes, I'm letting you know right now, you're not alone. You're not the only one. You, you were not singled out other than the fact that you were what they call a suppressive person and they wanted to get rid of you. But she goes, there's a lot of people like you out there hurting for the same thing. And, and that actually made me feel better because for a long time I felt really selfish about the whole thing. I thought, am I being just selfish and self-centered here? I mean, you know, I just, I felt like I didn't even have a right to talk about it. You know, maybe I was just, you know, too selfish. Well, it's not know. normal. Yeah. Look, it's not normal in normal situations, but when you're dealing with a cult, which Scientology certainly is, uh, in my opinion, uh, you're dealing with a cult, yeah. then yeah, I mean, <laughs> in cults, weird things happen, you know, criminal things happen, you know? Yeah. So. Well, uh, just to segue into the cult-like aspect of this, to kind of give people an idea how Scientology is kind of like a, I don't know, I guess you could say it's like a spider with multiple you know, feet on it. Uh, I had met a married couple who, uh, when I went to, to Nashville uh, a number of years ago to see if any of her old properties were still there, and they were, they had still, they were still under her mom and dad's name. And I ran into a lady that knew her uh, mom when they went to Catholic school together in New Jersey. And her husband said, yeah, I remember my wife showing me a picture of your mother-in-law. And, you know, she was a model in New York and everything. And she goes, when she went to Catholic school with her, she saw a picture of her and her family, my mother-in-law, her parents and her siblings down in Argentina at a property down there. And they were all dressed in white robes, dancing around like this statue. And the photo that she showed me from their yearbook uh, I could tell, you know, even in this nice Catholic school yearbook, my mother-in-law had this just almost blank expression on her face. And she goes, Bill, I wish I, you know, I wish I could tell you more. But she goes, I, it's obviously that her whole family was into cult-like behavior. Now, I did find out this. My mother-in-law's dad was an army colonel uh, in Korea. And he, he was up along the DMZ with a special unit. And, you know, when you start hearing names like special units and things like that, you start thinking, uh uh-uh, black ops. Um, he always had a lot of money for a guy that was just a colonel. Back in those days, you know, colonels weren't pulling down much money, obviously more than enlisted men, but not the way they were living. And uh, my mother-in-law's mother, she was a stay-at-home wife. And when I heard about that, that they had a place down in Argentina, I started asking around. And one of the things I found out was, you do remember a group called Children of God. Do you remember that? Is that the one with the fishy hook people? Uh, that's the people that River Phoenix and his parents were associated yes. yeah, with right, in right. Venezuela. They yeah, they yeah. were having sex with children. And whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. And what happened was when they got thrown out of Venezuela, they changed their name to Family of God and moved to Argentina. And they moved in right across the road from the Scientology facility and right down the road from this Family of God was where my mother-in-law's parents bought some property. 
So they're like all connected. They're all living like right next to each other. And I find that to be a little bit more coincidental. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think it was a coincidence that they bought property next to one another. Yeah. I mean, do and you? No, no. Yeah. And when I was down there, I mean, people say, well, isn't Argentina like all Spanish? I mean, why would they allow a bunch of white people to move in? I said, it's not all that much all Spanish. There are a lot of Caucasian people living in northern Argentina in that area. A lot of people. A lot of um, Germans, too, somehow. Yep. Uh, Germans. <laughs> um, when, I was, when I was down there, uh, they had like a French colony down there. There's like 100 French people some married with children, some single, all living on this spread, and they have, you know, like these cabins and everything built. I don't know. Argentina's got a weird thing going on. I don't know. They like cults or something. I, I'm not sure. It's kind of hard to say. Don't cry but, for uh, me, Argentina. And, yeah. Yep, I remember the that Perones. one. The Perones, yeah. Yeah, well, also, re- also remember, too, Argentina is where a lot of Nazis, you know, right, are alleged yeah. to have gone. And so I find this whole cult thing and all this all coming together there just to be, there, there's no way it's coincidence. And then, you know, like in the case of River Phoenix, you know, ha, this kid comes out, says he was forced to have sex to other children, and then and then two years later he's about ready to be interviewed big time. I mean, he'd already been interviewed by small outlets. Now it was going to be big time. I think it was Barbara Walters or somebody was going to interview him. All of a sudden the kid ends up dead, you know. And uh, I do know that there are people uh, around my wife who she knew in Scientology because when she went to Apple school, um, she actually lived on the property. They actually had dormitories there, and she got mad and, and moved out of her mom's house at like 13 or 14, and they put her in uh, one of the dormitories there at the school. And she had a girl that she had shared a room with, and that girl, they found her hanging in the gymnasium, uh, a suicide note written in somebody else's handwriting, not her own, and said that, oh, she was depressed because some boy dumped her. When the fact is, the guy they talked to said, we're still dating. And he was like totally freaked out. He went to a regular public school and met her and, and said, I didn't dump her. He says, there's nothing going on. So it's a situation like mine where it was normal, but they're trying to make it appear abnormal so they can, you know, justify what they're doing. And I can tell you, I've talked to a number of both men and women that have come out of the Apple schools and, oh, you want to talk about, I mean, you think the public schools are bad? Go to a Scientology school. You'll run back to the public schools. I mean, the public schools look like a, you know, a heaven compared to them. Uh, they just abuse people so bad. But one of the things I was going to get into is uh, one of the ladies that I had met, we were talking, and she was a homeschooler, and I was kind of razzing her about homeschooling like I did on your show. And she goes, well, Bill, some people do do it right. And I said, yeah, but I've met too many that do it wrong. And she goes, well, they're probably using Scientology's material. And I said, what? And she goes, You've heard of applied scholastics, haven't you? And I said, oh, God, yeah. I used to get one of those when I was in junior high for geography class. I, and I said, you know, I used to turn over and see Scientology on the back in their address, and it's like, what do they have to do with geography? But anybody that was ever in a public school that ever got the applied scholastics little geography booklet, that's, that's Scientology. But anyway, she told me that they had been since the mid-'70s running a homeschooling outlet through applied scholastics and was supplying a lot of the fundies homeschooling material, and I'm like, well, no wonder the fundies are so screwed up, you know, whereas the secular humanist homeschoolers were going to legitimate homeschooling groups and getting good material, books and such like, and we were joking about it. I never never understood that. Why wouldn't you just get your material out of an encyclopedia? Yeah. I, I mean, there are so many legitimate places where you can get textbooks. You can go straight to the textbook manufacturers. But the fundies, for some reason, don't want to do that, and they're getting all their material from these offshoot, almost cult-like groups, and it doesn't it doesn't make any sense because I've talked to uh, secular homeschoolers who actually do a thousand times better job homeschooling than the Christian fundies. I mean, they they leave them in the dust. Yeah. yeah. You know, and they're like, what is it with these fundies? Why are they so crazy? So, yes, I have a tendency to jump on homeschooling. And for your listeners, listeners, I'm sorry, I went overboard last time. But I do mean the extreme right Christian fundamentalists have problems. 
secular homeschoolers definitely, you know, do a much better job. And I was surprised to find out how many fingers Scientology has in all the pies in the world. I, and to find out that they have so many front groups. I mean, I, I, I knew as a kid they had applied scholastics, but I didn't know that they were l like doing uh, drug programs. And uh, most people do not know this, but they do the D.A.R.E. program, but they, they keep it separate from themselves because it was a Scientologist who happened to be an L.A. narcotics officer that started D.A.R.E. And D.A.R.E. is a total failure. I mean, that's it's a joke. I mean, they show up at your school with this uh, briefcase, they open it up, and there's all yeah. kinds of things in there. And I remember sitting in class. You know, every, every kid I ever talked to, okay, not, I never said – when they showed that, these were kids who wanted to do drugs and were already into it. Mm -hmm. When the when the cop, I remember this, the cop had a big case with yeah. a clear thing on it, and there was all these samples of drugs, right? Like coke yep. and marijuana. And then he'd yep. one by one show it to you and say, this is how this affects you. This is how this affects you. This, you know, these are the, you know, effects of it, right? Mm -hmm. And kids that do drugs or apt to do drugs will go, you know, when the cop came in, I want to do every one of those drugs. Yep. Yep. I had a, I had a friend that thought exactly like that. He even made a joke in class. He told the cop, he says, can I have that pill right there? And he yeah. goes, this is not a joke, son. And he goes, oh, yeah, but I'd like to get high. And I'm like, are you an idiot? This is a cop. And you're talking about getting high in front of him? You know, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a joke. But they also have Al-Anon and Narconon, which are two failures. They, they have those in the prison systems. They have them in the juvenile detention centers, and they've proven to be total failures too. You know. Yeah. The only, I mean, now the scared straight program that that kind of works. Yeah, if you got people that are already scared, they know they're on their last leg, and you know they're either going to the coroner's office or prison for life. Uh, scared straight can work. Yeah. 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 Oh, hey, by the way, uh, a listener uh, typed in that. Uh, Johnny Depp owned the Viper Room at the time when River Phoenix was uh, took that uh, overdose. Yep. Yeah, yep. Johnny yep. Depp. Yeah. And there was a lot of scared people. After in fact, that he died right outside of the door. He he was in yep. the joint and left, yep. and he collapsed right in front of the door. What his and his brother Leaf was there, and at mm -hmm. the time, his brother, uh, I think his name was Leaf Phoenix. He's an actor now. Mm-hmm. He was only what, like fourteen or thirteen? Oh yeah, yeah. And it's like, well, what was he doing in that club? That you know, at that young. Well, we we yeah. used to go in there when we were underage. We could get yeah. in just because my mother in law dropped her name and they let us in the door. We we were drinking underage all the time. I mean, we were boozing it up. Now we stayed away from the drugs, you know, because I had seen it, you know, here in the town where I lived. I had a a uh, kid lived down the street from me. It's like five years older than me. He OD'd. He, they revived him, but, you know, I saw him bring him out of the house, and I told my wife, I said, you know, let's drink, but I don't want to touch the drugs. They scare me, and she agreed with me. So, I mean, we had people offer them to us, you know, let's, hey, let's do a line of Coke or something, you know. And, you know, when you got celebrities asking you to do it, you're like, oh, my God, they're talking to me. But I knew better, you know. I was like, nah, I said, I'll share a drink with you, but nah, I ain't doing the other stuff, you know. Mm. And um, you know we sat and 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 hung out with people back in the in, in the day. You know a lot of actors and stuff. And you know they knew who my mother in law was. You know and everything. And they're like, oh yeah, she was a model back in the day. I'm like, yeah. You know and um, you know so I got to talk to these people, which was fun to me. It was great. You know. Right. You know. Hey, you know, get talking about disappearances. Did you ever read a book by Rodney Stitch? called um defrauding america yep oh you did yep <laughs> did you ever read the part where he said that there were 20 like you know gorgeous either 20 or 40 models supermodels that were put on a plane a cia plane and told they were going to singapore to do like a an event or a show and oh. the pilot got the call to turn around and go into mainland china and the women were given as gifts to Chinese generals. Whoa. And he said the women were never heard from again. Wow, I didn't I don't remember reading that part. I'd have yeah, I that's got the, the book, book here Defra somewhere. I'll have to go back and yeah, read yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, It's in the book Defrauding America by Rodney Stitch. And I'll tell you what, man, that book is amazing. I read it a long time yeah. ago. Um, yeah. 
That well, book I, is, I, yeah. Yeah. The, the reason I got interested in that book, well, the, you know, because well, Rodney Stitch and his whole thing about the corruption in the aircraft industry and everything and the air traffic controllers and everything, that's why I got interested in his yeah, book. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I'll have to I'll have to go back and and read that because I don't remember that part. It's oh god, it's been forever since I read that. I can't yeah, remember how yeah. long ago it was. It is in that book. I remember reading it. And, uh, another book yeah. you might want to read uh, that's really interesting is um, "Sins of the Father." It's a book on the Kennedy family, particularly mm. Joe Kennedy, by uh, Tupper C. Sassy or Sassy Sassy Tupper. I got It's called "Sins of the Father." It's a book on the the Kennedys. Okay. You know, especially Joe Kennedy and all of his shenanigans. That was pretty interesting. He would frame people for murder and rape. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the reason why I, I talked about those those models, um, you know, because we were getting into disappearances. We were talking earlier about, uh, you know, people disappearing, uh, especially in the national parks and, mm-hmm. you know, movies like Taken, you know, where women, especially, you know, pretty girls are taken. Uh, yep. You know, one time I was in a club and this this really pretty girl, I was talking to her and she told me, she goes, oh yeah, she goes, uh, and she was tall, statuesque, you know, beautiful woman, like blue-green eyes, and she said, yeah, I'm, I'm going down to South America, uh, these Christians, and I'm going to be modeling in South America, you know. And as soon as she and she said, "Oh," and they, I said, well, "Are you sure?" I mean, that kind of, sounds kind of dangerous. She goes, "Oh no, they're Christians." And as soon as she says that, said that, my radar went off. Like my, I said, "Oh my God," you know. Yeah. I, kind of, I warned her. I said, "You know what goes on down there?" <laughs> you know. I've been I've been down there. I know that's where I went looking for my wife and uh, got led away from a Scientology facility at gunpoint. So I know. Yeah, I got yeah. right up to the gates, uh, had a guy down there who's kind of an informant uh, for the DEA, and he said, well, I know they bring a lot of Americans down here to this facility. Um, he says, I can take you there, but he says, you're not going to get in. And we went up, and uh, he stayed in the car, and I went up to the gate, and I asked, I said, uh, uh, this Scientology facility, and he goes, yeah, why? And I said, are there any American citizens uh, here? I said, uh, you know, I just came right out and said, I said, my wife has been missing for a while. I said, she's a Scientologist. I said, um, uh, I think she may have been brought here. It's it's possible. I said, I, I don't know. I said, um, you know, do you have any Americans from Los Angeles? And he goes, well, that's now your business. He says, it's a private facility, the private property. It's a religious institution. He says, I'm not going to tell you who's here. Um, he, he, he says, um, you know, who told you this facility was here? And I said, well, I heard about it in America. And, uh, he says, well, you shouldn't be here. And I said, listen, I said, can I at least come in and look around? I said, I won't even tell anybody where the place is at. I said, I come in and look around. I said, I don't see anybody that looks like my wife. I said, I'll leave and you'll never hear from me again. And that's when he opened the gate. And that's when I saw the MP5 at his side. And I was like, oh crap, I'm done. And he says, I think it's time for you to leave. And uh, he escorted me back down to the car, and he told the DEA guy, he says, don't ever bring him back up here again. He says, the next time he comes back up here, he ain't leaving. And uh, I got in the car, and the guy looked at me, and he says, you almost got us both killed. And he says, uh, I told you not to talk to them. And I said, I need to know, and I'm not stopping. I said, there's no way I'm stopping. Uh, we went back to the airport, and I found something very, very strange that, the DEA, the FBI, the CIA, U.S. military, they all know about these facilities. And it's always made me wonder what kind of connection there is to the U.S. government. You know, is the government using these facilities for their own Gitmo type operations? And the reason I asked that question was because my wife found a letter from David Miscavige to the Central Intelligence Agency in 1987 thanking the CIA for getting them out of trouble with the government of Argentina. Now, that letter is now out on the Internet. Um, I put that out there years ago. I gave it to a lot of the anti-Scientology groups. And nobody has asked the most pertinent question yet. Why would the CIA go to bat for American citizens who got in trouble in a foreign country? 
that's a State Department issue, not a CIA intelligence issue. And uh, nobody really thought too much about that. And when I asked the question, people came back and said, well, do you think there's a connection? I'll say, well, go read the old MK Ultra documents. What did the CIA say they did? Stansfield Turner, what did he say when he was interviewed by Congress, when he was interrogated? He says they used, quote, cult-like groups, black magic groups, and religious groups, both mainstream and alternative, to run their operations during the MK Ultra days. Wow. Not only that, but you do know that John, Dr. John Breeding is a Scientologist, and he worked on the remote viewing program with Ingo Swan, who is also a high-level Scientologist. Both of them are. Yeah. It's the CIA, it seems that the you know, the, uh, this may sound crazy, but, you know, the Scientologists and the porn industry, the BDSM in the community, and uh, mm -hmm. this, this, the alphabet agencies are all interlinked. Yeah, yeah, there, you know? there's, no, there's no separation between them. They're all interlinked. Yeah. Yeah. And another link that I found was a woman contacted me from California and said, do you know during that Columbine shooting, Ingo Swan was in Denver? And I said, I didn't know that. And she goes, do you know what he was doing there? And I said, no. And she goes, he was trying to remote view the inside of the school for the FBI to see if there was anybody left alive in there. That's what she told me. And that's in the chapter of my book under special operations because the local police noticed that there was a white van sitting down the street from Columbine. It had civilian plates on it, but it was a white panel van. And when they walked up and talked to the driver, he showed them an FBI ID and said that they're part of an FBI surveillance operation. And the cop looked inside. It was the Jefferson County Sheriff and said there were two men in back that were just sitting there. Right. That oh, tell you? Hold on. I just want to give the call letters. You are listening to WCJV Digital Broadcasting, Youngstown, New York, CJ Mars Radio. I'm Mike Ray, your host. This is Parlay. And we have with us William Zabel. Uh, and William has been uh, giving us a lot of good information here. Uh, really, I mean, this, this is stuff that people need to know because, you know, you're not going to hear a lot of this from the mainstream media at all. I mean, uh, you know, because a lot no. of them are part of it as far yeah, as I'm well, concerned, you know. I mean, yeah. And, and even if they're not part of it, if you get a talk show host that wants to go after Scientology, they oftentimes find themselves getting sued. This is a very sue-happy organization. And they're not the only ones. There's a number of religious groups that will uh, go after the media for talking about them. Now, recently, there's been a lot of talk about, well, Scientology is on its way down. You know, they're in trouble over in Norway and, and such like. And I'm like, guys... If this is a CIA operation, it's not going anywhere. And even if it's not, look how many years they have gotten away with murdering their own members, stealing their money, everything under the sun you can think of. This is the group that successfully sued the IRS. Even the militia patriot nitwits couldn't win a lawsuit against the IRS, and this bunch of cult idiots yeah, they did. Don't pay, uh, uh, um, okay, Scientology, even though they're technically, I mean, they're a business, right? They sell things. They don't yeah. pay taxes. Nope, because they sued the IRS and got 501c3 status. Now, it was taken away a number of years ago, but then they sued again and got it back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So... I guess I can see. Kind of I, see, I'm, now I'm, I used to think that it, it was okay that religions or churches didn't pay taxes, but you know what? They most most churches or synagogues or you know they don't do soup kitchens anymore. They don't do any kind of homeless or you know any kind of outreach. If anything, all they do now they're in the money game. Mm -hmm. You know. Yep. Oh yeah. Yeah. And well, th they'll they'll like fund or open a uh, like a retirement home. But only to get all the assets of the you know the the people that they're taking care of. Yeah, yeah. So I you know you know to give you an idea you know we always talk about like the so CIA. I, I think it's time that you know I think it's time that uh, these churches started paying their taxes, especially these mega churches. Look oh, how much yeah. money, look how much oh, money. Yeah. Um, oh, what's that guy? Uh, he's in Texas. Uh, Kenneth Copeland, uh, Joel yeah, Osteen. Yeah, all of them. Yeah, right. Osteen, yeah. Benny Hinn. Yeah, man. Yeah. I uh, mean, they're, God they're, almighty. They're, yeah. 
Well, Kenneth Copeland's a billionaire, and and you got to remember that Joel Osteen never spent one day Joel in seminary. Joel Osteen, sure, yeah, that's he, the guy. Yeah, he looks he like never, the devil's son. Yeah, he never you know? spent one day in seminary school. He has a master's degree in marketing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, anyways, and you don't even know how much money they take in, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, if you don't mind real quick, I'm going to give you some names here to tell you and see if you recognize any of these names. Sure, the, way to, the Way to Happiness Foundation, have you ever heard of that? <laughs> no, I haven't. They created Death Education in Clearwater, Florida that ended up in all our public schools. They are a Scientology front. Wow. CCHR, Citizens Commission on Human Rights. I never heard of that either. That's an organization under the United Nations. It is also a Scientology front. Health Med Clinic. That is a nationwide uh, clinic uh, run by Scientology. There is the Cult Awareness Network. Nice. So they get out themselves. Yep. So they can out themselves. Narconon, Alanon, and Dare, all Scientology. Now, here's one. If you're a homeschooler, you've heard of this one. Association for Better Living and Education. Okay. That's another group that supplies homeschooling material to homeschoolers, and it's a Scientology front, like Applied Scholastics. Then there's the one called World Liter- Literacy Crusade. Do you know who pimps that organization? No, who? Benny Hinn. Really? Yep, Benny Hinn uh, pimps the World Literary Crusade. It's in his commercials on his website all the time. Oh, and uh, does he know that they're Scientologists? I would assume so. Ever, what am the I rest saying the at world. this point? You know, I'm, yeah, I, I don't think it matters, but the rest yeah. of the world does, so he should. And then, of course, there's Applied Scholastics, which also supplies homeschooling material. But guess what Applied Scholastics also does? They also supply some, not all, but some public and private school educational material as well. According to their website, uh, nationwide, they apply, uh, they supply about 15% of public and private school educational material. (laughs) Now you also have Concerned Businessmen of America. A lot of Christian churches are involved in that, and that is a Scientology front. You also have what's called Downtown Medical. Uh, Those are back east in New York. They're like free clinics. You have Criminon which is the rehabilitation program run through the county court systems. You also have the World Institute of Scientology Enterprise called WISE. Uh, basically, it's, it's so ridiculous. They supply uh, maps of the world, uh, local maps. They also have educational material. You also have something called the Drug-Free Marshals set up by actor John Travolta and an FBI agent, and it was set up right after his son died. How nice. And then you have Advanced Ability Center, uh, which is created uh, by Scientologists. Uh, They use Scientology uh, concepts. Uh, They're basically like a free clinic for shrink patients is basically what it is. And then you have New Era Publications, which is an international publishing house for L. Ron Hubbard's work, but they also sell a lot of books for non-Scientologists, too. So, and that's just the groups people know about. There's believed to be probably a couple of hundred more that nobody knows about because they haven't been outed yet. Any group that can fit through the front door, can get their way and put their foot in the public and private schools, can put their foot into the IRS, the FBI, the CIA, you know, or and all these other organizations, any church that can do that, is very, very powerful and very dangerous. And that is why groups like this need to be investigated. Uh, My wife is not the only one that has disappeared. There are hundreds of people just from Scientology alone. 
I have been told by cult researchers that there's other cults in America, nowhere near as big or powerful, where people have disappeared. So people, I'm not the only one that this affects. This affects hundreds, maybe thousands yeah. of people and families. And that is why there needs to be a true full investigation into these groups and to get them shut down. They've got too yeah. much money and they've got too much power and they hurt and kill too many people. Hold, hold on, hold on. Uh, if anyone wants to call in, 716-745-4266. That's 716-745-4266. Yeah, if there's any Scientologists you want to call in, uh, feel free. We'll, uh, we'll put you, we'll put you on the air. <laughs> And we'll oh, yeah. uh, we'll have a lively debate, you know. Oh yeah. Seven one six seven four five four two six six. Um. Wow. Hey, did you want to get into um, you know, on top of disappearances and uh, that um, because we were talking earlier about people disappearing in national parks or. Sure, and we can kind of get into what happened to me and yeah, yeah, and yeah. Let's, how let's, it how. And how it segues yeah. into these other missing people. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Um, so do we want to wait for callers or just go ahead and go? No, no, and... Just keep going to another. Okay. Um, I got interested in all these disappearances, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, because it kind of opened up a memory with me when I started listening to Coast to Coast AM. A uh, guy was on there talking about missing people in the parks. He wrote a book called Missing 911. And when he yeah, started describing uh David Politis. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I want to yeah. give him credit. And uh, I really got shook up because I was like, oh, my God, this, you know, this goes back to me. And I described for people what happened um, after my stepdad died in an auto accident. We were, my mother and I were trying to, put everything back together and uh, try to get reorganized and everything. So my aunt and uncle took us to the Rocky Mountain National Park uh, for the weekend. And uh, the first night there, in fact, uh, when we pulled in and got through the gate, I felt a strange feeling like there was eyes on me. Somebody was watching me. And, you know, you know, when you come out of a trauma of an auto accident, you don't know where your mind's at. You don't know if you're thinking straight or not. So you just kind of ignore things that don't seem right. Like you're that thinking, cabin in the woods kind of thing? You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and you just figure, well, you know, I just went through a trauma. I'm just, you know, I'm just hearing things or sensing things that are not right. But anyways, we get set up, and I'm sitting there that night, and my uncle was cooking hamburgers and everything, and, and they had these logs for, like, long benches you could sit on. And I'm sitting there, and I'm facing west, and all of a sudden I get this feeling like there's somebody watching me from behind, and I got this feeling to get up and go like a command, get up and go up the hill. So I did. And nobody tried to stop me. They probably thought I was just walking up to check out nature, whatever, and I kept walking, and I probably got about three quarters of the way up this hill and all of a sudden the air got so heavy my chest felt like there was a brick on it I couldn't breathe and next thing I know boom I just black out that's it and um, I wake up a little bit later I thought maybe it was just you know the asthma caused something and I passed out I thought maybe I was out for a minute or so maybe at most and when I wake up I'm standing up. I'm not laying on the ground. I'm standing and I'm looking down the hill and my mother, my aunt and uncle and some lady that was helping them look for me were coming up the hill screaming and yelling at me. My mother is, you know, really just giving me crap. And I'm like, what? Okay. I had an asthma attack. What, you know, you know, what's going on? And they had a park ranger there and they brought me back down the hill and he said, where have you been? I said, right there. And he goes, no, you've been gone. And I said, I didn't go anywhere. I just went up the hill. I said, I probably had an asthma attack. I'm all right now. And he goes, no, son, you've been gone for three and a half hours. And I stopped dead. And I'm like, what? Uh, I'm like, no, no, no. I just walked up the hill just a couple of minutes ago. No. And they're like, yes, you did. Because That's everyone just... followed, you know, they followed my tracks around. They knew exactly where I'd gone and how long I'd been gone. I'd gone over the hill gone up another small mountain range, walked across the ridge, down by a, 
a cliff area and then back and then back up that hill. And I was like, I couldn't believe it when they told me that. I thought it had been just a minute, that it had been three and a half hours. There's a quick question. Uh, I wonder if William experienced what David Pilatus writes about in his books. Did he feel it was mind control or did you have any after effects? I, I wasn't... I wouldn't have called it mind control at that age. I think I was 10 years old when that happened. Uh, but but I you def- were definitely lured, you might say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely yeah. somebody was wanting me to come up that hill. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. I mean, yeah. somebody or something, you know. And it sounds like a negative experience. I mean, I would take that as a, a negative experience. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, this after time, that. Why else would someone blank out your mind like that if, you know? Yeah, I know I was always scared of the dark after that because before that, I could watch all kinds of horror movies and everything else. After that, you couldn't get me to watch a horror movie. And I had to have all the curtains in the house closed after that. My mother used to go nuts because she used to like to leave them a little bit apart in the living room so she could see cars going by. I said, no, all the curtains are closed. And I even took paper and tape and taped uh, paper over the window. We had a window in the living room you mean, door. You mean at night? Taped, so you at mean night, at night, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, I, and I taped the window, and I moved my bed away from the window. I pushed my bed over to the opposite wall, and I pushed the curtains tight and then used clothespins to keep them from coming open. And I did that for years. I think I did that up to I was like 13 or 14 years old. Jeez. And I used yeah. to go outside at night before that, too. I used to, My friends and I used to go riding bikes. We had those little lights on the wheels and everything. And I'd go out to like 9 o'clock and then go home. And I told them, I said, I'm not going outside at night. And they're like, what? And I said, no, I'm not going outside at night. I'm not going to do it. And it was probably around 14 uh, when my ex and I used to get together. And my wife, I hate calling her ex. I don't think she is. But sometimes I still catch myself doing it. Um, we wouldn't go out at night unless we had people with us because of that if we were going to go out to a party i would make sure there was a lot of others with us like i didn't want to go out with her by myself I always had we always had to have a group uh of her friends with us and uh you know and then when i would stay with her and her mom um i would sleep down in the basement because there were no windows down there i didn't have to worry about anything and i slept in a room that had no outside lighting whatsoever and they always thought that was kind of weird. You know, what are you doing? You know, I could have slept in one of the six bedrooms upstairs if I wanted to, but I didn't want to be anywhere near windows. Gotcha. You didn't want to be taken out of a window. Yeah. Well, yeah. I had that I had that dream six years ago, and um, we face DIA where, I, where I'm living now. And there's always all kinds of strange stories about DIA, but one night I had a dream that I – woke up and I was floating. Now, I've had this dream several times, and the one time that I had it, I was awake, and I was floating in the air, and as soon as I started thrashing around, I fell back to the bed, but I was definitely in the air. This night, six years ago, I was being pulled towards the window and um, this uh, when my mom was still alive, and she could hear the commotion, and she came in, and I was laying by the window. And she goes, what are you doing laying by the window? I said, something just tried to pull me out the window. And she goes, what? I said, yeah, something tried to pull me out the window. Now, when you say pull out the window, was the window open, or would you? do you think that oh, you would? No, you would... It, it was closed. And I think whatever it was thought that, you know, I stayed the new age enough to think that, to know that whatever these creatures are, call them gray aliens, call them whatever, I think they thought I, they were grabbing some type of ether or spirit. And they thought that that's what they were grabbing because I, I'm looking at the window coming up and I'm like, what is this? I, I'm, I'm going to hit the window and it's going to break glass. And just as I got to the window, I put my feet out because I was going out feet first. And I put my feet on the glass and all of a sudden, boom, I dropped to the floor. Ooh. She was levitating. Yeah, and it's not the first time. I've had a couple of times where I have woken up and been in the air, floating in the air. That's insane. Yeah. Huh. I, you know, I always thought stuff like that was etheric, meaning 
physically you're physically in bed, but they take your etheric body. But you know, you never know. I mean, I've heard it to where. The, um, did you ever hear this? This one lady, she wrote her name in her underwear. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so she had an abduction experience, and they, you know, she, she wakes up in her bed and she, but she's wearing somebody else's underwear. And Whoa. <laughs> yeah, listen, <laughs> gets better. Somebody, a, another girl in Japan found her name in her underwear. Uh, she was the same thing. A girl in Japan, a woman in Japan, woke up wearing someone else's clothes. And her na- the name was on it, and she huh. looked it up because we're in the digital age, and said, "I'm wearing your underwear." <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. Yep. So who knows? I mean, who knows what's going on? Yeah. You know. But I've had I've had strange encounters. I remember before that incident up at Rocky Mountain National Park. I remember. I was helping my uncle after he was in a combining accident where he got his leg cut off. And I was out there helping him irrigate and went to bed one night and woke up. And this light was sitting in the pasture pasture right beyond the uh, little grain elevators we had. And the thing shot right up in the sky. And we went out the next morning and there was a mutilated cattle out there. I think there was just one. Just weird things like that. And, oh, by the way, going back to that whole thing with Rocky Mountain National Park, about 10 years ago, it was like 2004, 2005, my cousin was working with a woman at a shop down in Cherry Creek, and she wanted to take a a day off. And she went up to the Rocky Mountain National Park and was sitting in the parking lot and blew her brains out with a gun. And they called my cousin because... Her family lived out of town, and he was the only one. He called me. He says, I, I, he said, I can't go up there alone. Let's go. We went up there, and they said that she killed herself in the car, but we met a park ranger who was there, and he pulled us aside, and he goes, uh, you friends? And I said, yeah. And he goes, they ain't telling the story like it should be. And, I, and my cousin's like, what happened? He says, let me show you. We went off in the parking lot on a trail, and there's some yellow crime scene tape, and she had killed herself in this spot. But he figures that somebody put her back in the car and put the gun in the car because there was no broken glass in the car, but the bullet went through her head, which means it would have had to have exited the car. He had told me that she was the fifth person they'd found who had committed suicide in the exact same spot over the last 12 years. But you know, you gotta. Well, why are they do? Why are they doing this? What is the purpose? They don't want people to think that something is happening, you know, off in the in the park. And I think this was a a very stupid attempt. And oh, I, talk- I see what you're saying. In other words, in other words, she, she got killed in the park, and then yeah. whoever they, they were the- put her yeah. back in the car and put a bullet through her head, or to make it look like a suicide. Yeah, yeah. And the the gun was not hers. They they don't know where she got the gun. She never owned a gun. Nobody she knew owned a gun. Um, there, Like I said, there was no brain matter, no blood in the car, no nothing. And trying to tell us that she killed herself in the car was stupid. We could clearly tell nobody died in there. And David Politis, I called into uh, when he was on, uh, I can't remember, it wasn't Coast to Coast, it was one of the other shows, and I'd asked him about that. And he said he had heard of cases like that, and he says the Park Service goes well out of their way to try and keep the incidences that are unexplainable away from the public. They always try to make it look like the person fell off a cliff or they were depressed and committed suicide. And he says they don't want these heavily traveled areas to become well-known crime scenes. So he says that's probably why they may have taken her body back to the car so people would think she did it there in the parking lot because this was a heavy, heavy trail, heavily traveled trail where she did this. And, um, um, you know, there, that was like, you know, the fifth one in 12 years in the exact same spot that committed suicide. Right, right. Yeah. And I'll tell you a little bit about that, what Native Americans think of Rocky Mountain National Park. My great-grandmother um, on my grandfather's side of the family, on my mom's side, my grandfather, his mother is a full-blooded Cherokee. 
we could never get her to go to the Rocky Mountain National Park. She says, I'm not going anywhere near that place. And uh, when my grandmother was little, my grandma used to try and get her to take, you know, to take her up there. And she'd say, no, Gracie, we're not going up there. I'll go anywhere you want, but we're not going there. And Native Americans, if you talk to them, they will not go near these national parks with a 10-foot pole. You couldn't pay them to go in there. So they know something. Yeah, I, you know, maybe someone or something is living under those mountains, you know, well, I, like a bow yeah, rock I, or something. <laughs> and yeah. What are rings? Yeah, well, I remember one time in the 90s uh, when they had Bigfoot sightings. Now, this is the thing about Bigfoot. You, you, you're not talking about uh, uh, what they call a North American ape. This thing has intelligence and maybe even human for all we know. Um uh, I was told by an old rabbi years ago who had been studying this, and he told me that a lot of the uh, old school, old biblical, Old Testament types believe that uh, Bigfoot is part of Esau's clan, because in the Old Testament it says that Esau and his people were cursed by God, so God covered them in red hair. Oh, and, yeah. And yeah, so some of the Old Testament people believe that Bigfoot might be human, and it makes sense. I mean, it really does, because I have studied all of the old sounds that uh, they have heard Bigfoot make. And back when I was researching UFOs, I'd ran into people who had actually come face-to-face -face with Bigfoot and say they can talk. One person was a lady that worked up here at the U.S. Department of Commerce in Fort Collins at their underground facility. There is a military air force. Uh, it's a, like a little base up on top of the mountain above uh, the Commerce Department. And... There's been a ton of sightings going back to the 70s up there, and I'm trying to remember who it was. There was a, a writer who wrote a, a, a book about UFO sightings, big, thick book. I got it somewhere around here. And I can't remember his name, but he came up here to Colorado and investigated the Fort Collins sightings, and this lady took him up there, and she goes, look, there's a military facility right here that's not officially a part of the Air Force. If you look at Google Maps, it's all... Uh, covered up, you know, with the little uh, out-of-focus uh, spots. But it's right there on the mountain on top of the U.S. Department of Commerce, which their facility goes back for over a half a mile under the mountain. And lots of Bigfoot sightings there. I've talked to people who say they find animals dead all the time up there that look like they've been half-eaten, deer, elk, you know, things like that. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> Could they be uh, like shapeshifters or – I don't know what they are really. Um, well, if you've read some of the research out of the uh, place up there in Utah, the Skinwalker Ranch, uh, these Bigfoot-type creatures appear there and then disappear right in front of you. Uh, they could have a supernatural element to them, the ability to shapeshift. Um, yeah. um, I'll, I'll tell you, I have seen a few things over the years. Um, I remember a creature that was gray in color, real low to the ground, real long, about two feet long. Um, it would look like a, a small mouse extended out uh, about almost two feet, a foot or two feet, run across the road in front of me over on the west slope. And I was driving down the highway, and this thing, middle of the day, just ran across. Weird-looking creature. It stopped on the other side and looked at me. And this was not like a prairie dog or a groundhog or anything like that. I guess the only way to look at it is like a cross between a mouse and a wiener dog. He was long, but he was all like a grayish white. Right. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I, I've seen birds. Uh, I know people have seen birds here over Colorado that they have a beak that's like a foot long, and they look anorexic for birds. You can almost like see through their bodies, their feathers. You know, you can see the... Uh, light through their wings. I've seen a couple of those flying over. Like pterodactyls uh, or something? Something like that, a miniature yeah. pterodactyl. Really weird. Uh, people have commented for years about seeing these kind of birds here in Colorado. I'd say they're about, they have a wingspan that's probably three, four feet wide, and they're about two feet long. Yeah. Sure. Well, we're down, we got two minutes left. Um, is there anything else you wanted to cover? I this 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 two two hours went by quick. Oh yeah, you know. 
Yeah, I, th- I think we've covered it all. I just, you know, I just want to let people know. I'll say. Well, we definitely, we definitely got to have you back and and do a whole show on Columbine. And, oh yeah. And we have to cover, uh, you know, um, maybe sex trafficking and the movie Taken and stuff like oh, that. Oh yeah. Because you know we were talking about that before, so. Yeah, because you know. I had uh, when I was going to John Robert Powers uh, for acting and modeling in the nineties. Uh, we had a, a girl, she was right out of high school, probably 19, 20 years old, and she supposedly got a modeling job in Denver. This guy was new. Uh, he wasn't on a, a list of people, you know, legitimate companies, but they decided to risk it anyways. Sent her out to do some modeling assignment, and, and she disappeared. Jeez. And a year, and it looked like a year later, I was talking to the lady who runs John Robert Powers because she went to high school with my aunt, and I said, whatever happened there? And she goes, all I know is people reported seeing her in Europe somewhere, and she goes, we've heard nothing more. Wow. Boy, oh, boy. Well, listen, uh, <laughs> we're it's coming down to the end of the show here, and um, William, I want to thank you. You've been a great guest, as always. You're, thank you. You're, you're, yeah, you're so knowledgeable. And I just want to thank uh, Cindy Jean-Pierre, my producer, uh, I want to thank the people in the chat room, Dita. Uh, you're, you know, you're always a champ. I want to thank our listeners, and um, that's the show, folks. And uh, William, you want to give your uh, book again? Yeah, it's called The Phantoms of Columbine. You can find the electronic version on the website, the phantomchasers.org. Um, this last chapter I'm doing right now is the last chapter. Once that's done, if you want to order the book, you can go to that website and send me an email. Um, if you want it as a PDF, I'm figuring probably ten bucks, maybe fifteen. You know, I'm not going to rip people off like a lot of these guys do that want fifty or a hundred dollars for a book. I I figure fifteen, ten, fifteen dollars no, is enough. Yeah, that's so, right. yeah, that's you know, right. so yeah, if they want a PDF that they wanted uh, printed. It probably costs another five dollars more uh, for the combs binding because those little monsters are pretty expensive. You have to buy them in a big package. The combs binding, but uh, the printed version will be a Combs uh, bound book. Okay, great. And uh, folks, this is a great show. William Zabel, our guest. This is C- uh, WCJV Digital Broadcast in Youngstown, New York, CJ Mars Radio. I'm Mike Ray, your host. This is Parley, and we are out of here, folks. You are listening to WCJV Digital Broadcasting, Youngstown, New York.